Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's web conference, the NAMS Equine 2015-2016 call. With that, I'll turn the call over to Dr. Josie Traub Dargatz. Josie, please go ahead. Thank you everyone for joining our March 30th uh, Equine NAMS webinar. And I'd like to, I am the lead on the equine study, and I'll be doing several of the presentations uh, today. But I want to go ahead and introduce Dr. Kath Marshall. She's the Acting Monitoring and Modeling Director, and she was also part of the equine team that developed uh, the study materials. And she's going to do a brief welcome and address a couple topics that came up on the webinar from March 22nd. Yeah. Yep. Uh, good morning, everybody. So I just, uh, hopefully you can hear me better this week. And I just wanted to welcome you all to the training today and to say that we really appreciate your efforts. And we know that we couldn't uh, do these studies without you. So the topics that we uh, were undecided at the last uh, training were one, the non-disclosure agreement. And um, we've decided that those can be scanned and they can be emailed once they're signed. And before anybody gets um, the PII information, the operator's name, phone number, and address, uh, they need to sign those non-disclosure agreements. And then you can, to get the ball rolling, uh, scan them, email them to us, and then down the road at your convenience, uh, go ahead and email, not sorry, mail, regular mail, uh, the hard copies to us. And it might be best if you do that when you send the questionnaires to us. But however it works for you, works for us. Um, and the other thing that was left um, undecided at the last training was the, how to handle the PII information, which is the owner's name, address, and phone number. And those um, it would really be best if you could hand this over to the field in person. Uh, but if you can't do that, then go ahead and FedEx them. Uh, you can FedEx them when you mail out uh, those manuals or the questionnaires. But if you do that, if you could put it in a sealed envelope inside that package, it would be great. Otherwise, just send them separately. And um, it's our understanding that you should be able to use your own FedEx account for those. Uh, if you can't, then of course give us a call and we'll figure something out. And I think uh, for now those are the only updates. We did get some write-ins, Kath, that they were having a little trouble uh, hearing. So, so maybe I'll just reiterate it. Very briefly, a couple of those things. Um, the one item, and this is uh, for the coordinators, is that they have to have the non-disclosure form signed by any VMO or HT that's going to see owner name, address, uh, phone number, or go on the visit uh, before providing that. Um, and then the uh, non-disclosure form can be scanned or emailed to Abby. And the hard copy can be sent when you're sending us completed questionnaires or CDRs uh, at a later date. And then the other is to turn over the PII, name, address, phone number. Um, that either needs to be in person from the coordinator to the VMO or AHT, or it has to be sent by FedEx with a tracking number. So I think those were the main points. The other one that came up, um, was a question toward the end of the webinar last time about um, what if uh, VMO is bleeding a horse and um, something happens to the horse. Uh, and Dr. Marshall said that she would be discussing that question uh, with CEO leadership and uh, we would be providing some input on that at a later date uh, prior to when we doing the first visit. Uh, one suggestion I had on that topic um, was that for the farms that have the very high value courses, many of them have a veterinarian coming daily or every other day, um, would be to go ahead and arrange your visit when the practitioner would be there, their trusted uh, veterinary care person. Um, and the VMO selects the horses 
um, to be bled, but the practitioner collects the blood sample. And I can say from having been involved in research projects um, in Kentucky where we were looking at vaccine efficacy, I never put a needle in any of the horses on those farms. The practitioner drew the samples uh, while I was there to then take the blood sample. So some of them do have pretty strict um, protocols that they want to comply with. And we have no problem with that being the way the blood's obtained. So, um, but Kat said she'd um, get a little bit more information on the other question. And so that won't be addressed on the webinar today. Kat, did you have any other input um, before we move on? No, that's, um, that sounds good. OK. All right, so um, I want to just remind um, the VMOs, AHTs, and coordinators that we did conduct a webinar on March 22nd. And in that, we uh, covered a lot about confidentiality, setting up appointments, preparing for the visit. Uh, and we're not going to repeat that today. So please listen to the March 22nd webinar. It's currently available on the NOMS website under the link for Equine 2015 and then under the Equine 2015 questionnaire section. There are six different videos from March 22nd. We've labeled them with the basic topics that we covered uh, in each of them. Um, and if you have any questions once you listen to those, uh, don't hesitate to send those on to Abby and we'll, we'll try to get them addressed. All right. Um, the emphasis of our webinar today is going to be on the biologics and the biosecurity assessment for phase two of the equine study. And so we're going to be looking, uh, for those of you with the hard copy manual, uh, you can also pull up the manual electronically on the NOMS website under that section where I just told you the uh, March 22nd webinar was. There's also a PDF of the manual. Uh, there are hot links in the table of contents that will take you right to the tab that we're starting on, which is tab 5. And we're going to start on page 2. And I'm very briefly going to go over the biologics in total, uh, very briefly and superficially, so you get an idea of the scope of the biologics. And then we're going to be going into those in a bit more uh, detail. We also have uh, Allison's going to present on the kits. So we're going to go through a PowerPoint that actually tells you what will be contained in the kits, both supplies and paperwork. Um, so we'll be doing that today. But I just want to start out with an overview. So one of the biologics is to assess uh, anthelmintic resistance. That's one of our objectives. And so we're providing kits um, for the owners to collect fecal samples at the time of deworming, and then 10 to 14 days later, um, to look at whether uh, there's been a reduction in the fecal egg count. And Dr. Nielsen's on the line, and when we get to the more detailed part of parasites, he'll, he'll talk a little bit more about um, the collection and testing and what we've seen so far, because we do have 131 operations that have completed the questionnaire, uh, and I think 79 that have submitted uh, paired samples. Um, we're also going to be offering for a subset of the operations, uh, fecal culture and um, AST testing. Um, so fecal samples will be collected from equine by the VMO. Uh, they'll be sent to the ARS lab in Athens, Georgia for culture um, of non-type specific E. coli and then testing for salmonella and then susceptibility testing performed on those samples. We're also going to have the VMOs do a tick exam on up to 10 equine, most likely to have ticks, uh, collect a representative sample of ticks from each equine, and those will be submitted to the National Veterinary Services Lab for identification. And then uh, we also are asking um, that blood be collected. It's on a sliding scale based on the number of equine. And the goal here is to create a serum bank for future research. Uh, there will be no testing as part of the NOM study itself, although we may um, do some research uh, based on those serum samples that will be uh, collected. So the VMOs will be collecting blood um, on the equine while on the operation. 
And then there's the option for a biosecurity assessment. And this is a VMO AHT um, visualizing various aspects of biosecurity while they're on the operation and completing a checklist. Um, and uh, a report will be created from that. And then there'll be reports, and that's on uh, tab eight, and we're not going to go there right now. But just to clarify, um, the participants will get uh, multiple reports based on um, what we've just talked about. And we see this as an incentive for participation in the study. So I think when you're making those first calls, um, it's important to emphasize what they're going to be getting um, for their participation. So if they um, in the interview, complete the VMO questionnaire, which we talked about on the last webinar. Then they have the option to sign up for any of these biologic um, samplings and also for the biosecurity assessment. Uh, if they do the tick part, they'll get a report um, of the tick exam and identification of the ticks that are collected. If there are any ticks found on any one, if the 10 animals examined have no ticks, they're not going to get a report because they'll know none were found. But if we find even one tick, they'll get an exam report, and they'll also get identification of those uh, ticks. The parasite testing, they'll get pre and post deworming uh, fecal egg counts for strongiles. Um, they'll also get a report on asteroids. And then Martin reports any other parasite eggs that are found and we do generate a report. For those operations that are selected to participate in the antimicrobial resistance salmonella um, testing part, we are going to report salmonella test results as positive or negative, and then salmonella share group. We're not reporting the susceptibility testing. And then the biosecurity assessment will also be a report that will come back to the participants. So quite a few things that they're going to get out of their uh, participation. OK, so let's move to um, page four. And that's the timeline for the study. So essentially, you're going to be doing these biologic collections um, at the same time that you're doing the questionnaire. And the uh, visits to the farms, as we talked about last time, will be anywhere from May 1st through the end of September. If we haven't had the visits completed by then, those would be ones that just aren't going to, to happen. Now, it really is up to the VMO to decide whether the biologics will be done at the same time as the questionnaire or set up a second visit to the operation. And I think for operations that have very few equine, uh, it won't be overwhelming to do the questionnaire and the biologic sampling on the same visit, same day. But if they have a large number of equine, it's going to take a bit longer to complete the questionnaire and to complete the biologic sampling. So really, as you um, get that first script information about the type of operation and number of equine, you might be thinking about whether it's going to be a one visit or a two visit um, situation in order to complete the, the testing. There may be operations that only do the questionnaire and don't want to participate in the biologics, or they only want to participate in one of the biologics. So how long this visit will take really depends on the number of equine and how many of the biologics and the biosecurity assessment they, they want to participate in. Um, we'll go into the parasite a bit more, but the kits are going to be left by the VMO. The owners collect the pre- and post deworming fecal samples. And we're going to allow testing um, submission to go on till, till the middle of November. Um, because if you drop the kits off September 30th and, and they're going to deworm in October, we want to capture those, those farms. And then um, the page five, um, Camilla, who's here with us today, created this. It's, it's a very nice flow chart. It really, on one page, summarizes the biologics. Um, and if you're looking for a one-pager to kind of go through it with the participant, this is one that can really help um, them understand the options of what they could participate in. OK, so let's move on to um, page uh, six. And um, I'm going to go ahead and let Martin um, 
start to talk about the parasite testing. So that's on page six under tab uh, five. I just want to say just a couple things, and then we'll let Martin um, take off on that. So for the parasite testing, um, the VMO's role is to provide the kits to the operations that have not already participated in the parasite testing. And uh, yesterday I sent to the coordinators the uh, NOMS IDs for the operations that have already participated in the parasite testing. Um, we need the VMOs to put the NOMS ID number on the paperwork uh, in the boxes. And there's two boxes, one for pre-deworming samples and one for post-deworming. And Allison will talk about that a little more in her presentation. We want you to keep a record of the kit number associated with the NOMS ID in case for any reason paperwork problems occur, you would have a record of which kit number went with which NOMS ID. And then we want you to very briefly explain to the owners um, about the sample collection and submission. Uh, we have a very detailed storybook. Um, those are part of your manual um, that you can see. And so far, and Martin can address this, but we've had very good um, understanding by the owners of how to collect the samples and submit them, and, and quite good compliance with filling out the paperwork related to the animal sample. Um, the owners will get a report um, about the test results, and we also have two info sheets that Martin created um, that go out, the general information sheets about equine parasites that go out with the operation results. So Martin, why don't you go ahead and talk a little bit about the parasite part? Yes, and thank you very much. <clears throat> so the last time we talked about the, the questionnaire part of, of NOM survey and, and, the, and the questions relating to uh, parasitology as well as all the other components, and, and this is the, the fecal testing, you know, the thought about behind that is to have it sort of go hand in hand. So hopefully the questionnaire will generate some useful data, some demographics uh, that we can then use in a subsequent uh, statistical analysis of the findings that we're making. Uh, when we started talking about this project, the whole NAMS survey uh, a couple of years ago even, you know, um, Josie and others expressed an interest in including some kind of fecal parasite testing as part of the incentive for participants. So, you know, freebie, if you will, that they get out of participating. And I said, yes, but, it, you know, the only real value of doing an egg count or egg counts in, in a study like this is to do two counts, uh, one before deworming and one after. And, you know, just a single egg count uh, really is not going to, to generate very useful information. We're going to find that a lot of horses have strong jowl parasites. We kind of knew that already, so that should not surprise us. And then we're going to find, you know, some of these other parasite uh, categories that Josie also touched upon that we're, we're also looking for in these samples. But all in all, it's really not going to be all that interesting. I mean, there, these counts are, you know, vi variable, and it could be a lot of factors affecting them, and we would have challenges trying to account for all these possible factors. And looking for regional differences within the United States, you know, are not going to be that, that interesting because we just know that parasites, the parasite we're dealing with here, are basically omnipresent. They're everywhere. And, you know, just doing yet another study to document that parasites are found everywhere is, is sort of halfway a wasted effort. So I really said, you know, if we could somehow set up a system where we could collect two sets of samples from all the operations, and that could be useful because that would still give us some information about what the different types of parasites that are found, but more interestingly, how well do the uh, anthemitic or antiparasitic treatments that people are using, how well do they actually work? And that is really exciting because that NOMS has not provided this kind of information before. In the 1998 survey, it only included that one single egg count kind of data, and frankly, like I said, that wasn't all that useful. And now with this setup, all of a sudden we're putting a lot of challenge. We're really relying on all of you people out there, you know, because we want to make sure that each operation does go ahead and collect that second set of samples, which sometimes can be a challenge. And we know that even with some of the beef NOM studies, the beef cattle studies uh, that have been done with NOMs, 
And this was actually a problem for these managers to go back and identify the same animals and collect them once again after deworming. Now, as Josie just said, you know, the experience we have thus far with just providing written instructions uh, this fall and in the first few months of this year, you know, they're actually very good. Uh, so, you know, credit to uh, Josie and her team for writing very strict and concise instructions and storybooks and all that. Uh, we are pretty confident that when you guys all go out and start making your visits, you're going to increase the response rate even further. Um, so one specific item that's important is for the participants to understand that the testing, the parasite fecal testing, consists of pre- and post-deworming samples. So that is number one. Number two, uh, and that's another challenge that really we know from previous NOM studies and also from parasite uh, efficacy, treatment efficacy studies in general, is that it becomes very challenging on a distance to uh, register exactly what these horses were treated with. And if that information gets lost somewhere, you know, people go, yeah, we use this uh, blue, the tube, the blue and the white tube, you know, the one we always buy. You know, then all of a sudden information loses a lot of quality and becomes, you know, much less useful. So what we thought about, and this was something that popped up during several discussions we had in preparing this study, uh, was to have to ask people to include an empty deworming tube syringe uh, in their post-treatment sample box. And we were, this is, you know, this is not something we've tried to do before, but that was one way we could, you know, specifically identify exactly what brand name and what active ingredient were these horses treated with. Plus, the, the uh, participants also fill out that they're, you know, these, these questionnaires as to how they, how they dosed and what type of animals they have and how old they are and all that. Um, and we were a little bit, I'd say, excited to see how well people were actually able to follow these instructions. And the good news is that so far with the 79 farms operations from which we have both uh, pre- and post-treatment samples, uh, the large overwhelming majority have followed instructions and included this empty dewormer syringe. So we're really happy about that, but that, you know, is probably a, a point, uh, a talking point for you when you're out there talking to the uh, people at these operations to just to make sure that they're all clear about, you know, keeping one syringe and putting in, it into the box when they ship the post-treatment samples. And now just for a very brief summary of uh, what we have found so far on these uh, samples, because it's, it's, been, um, it's been quite fun so far. Uh, we have in total, like we said, 79 operations uh, with a total of 456 horses uh, from which we have at least uh, pre-deworming counts. Um, and for the large, large majority, we also have the post-deworming uh, counts as well. One thing I just did as I was preparing for this webinar uh, was to look at how many of these, all these egg counts we've done pre-treatment, how many of them are actually negative, zeros. We know that this is a problem. If you're doing a treatment efficacy study, you, you can't really do it if they're negative before treatment because there's no way of knowing whether the treatment worked or not. And it is a problem that a lot of mature horses, and the large majority of horses we have in this study so far are, you know, mature adult horses. They're not foals or yearlings. That a lot of them actually maintain either very low egg counts or egg counts that go below the detection limit of the method that we're using for generating the counts. And I, I, was, I, I was just reviewing another recently published uh, paper on anthematic resistance in several of uh, the eastern, northeast, eastern states of the U.S. And in that study, they, they screened 1,000 horses to find uh, 557 being negative. So they had to discard 557 horses, more than half, uh, before even going ahead and deworming them. So, so lots of horses that could not be used for the study. So obviously that is 
that is a potential risk that we're running with this study. Now, the good news is that we're not at 55 percent or whatever. Uh, so far, it's about 35 percent of all the samples we've tested that were negative. And so that means that on some farms, um, we're going to report that samples, you know, the, 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 the results are inconclusive in terms of efficacy because we did not have enough positives pretreatment or we had almost, you know, in some cases no positives. But on the large majority of operations, we actually did have a good number of horses, horses a count positive before deworming. And so we can, we can provide some useful information uh, for these people as to how well their treatments actually worked. Um, Briefly, just um, the large majority of operations use uh, products containing ivermectin. We knew this. This is not surprising. And so far, ivermectin seems to be working very well uh, on all the operations except one that had a few positive samples post-treatment. We do provide a service to these operations in case they're interested, they, they have the opportunity to go back and retest, so basically deworm again with the same product and send us another set of samples in which we will analyze again the same way just to see, you know, if we have reduced efficacy, it should be re repeatable or reproducible. Uh, uh, we've also seen farms use basically all the other products that, you know, and product categories that are on the market. So far we've found uh, some evidence of Pyrantel resistance, we found evidence of conventosol resistance. We found very few horses testing positive for ascarid parasites. I think the main reason is that these, these operations, for some reason, do not tend to have a lot of foals. That's where we find the ascarids. We found horses, several horses testing positive for tapeworms. We also found a few other uh, parasite categories here and there. Um, so that's where we are right now. Um, I don't know if we should stop and take some questions, Josie. Uh, that's certainly all I have. I had just a couple uh, comments, Martin, and then I agree we should do a, a short Q&A. Um, okay. We're actually asking them to put the empty container in the pre-deworming because we're asking them to collect the fecal samples on the day they deworm and then go ahead and put the empty container in. So it's the pre-deworming uh, box right. that they're putting Thank you. in. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, and um, there is a training module for the VMOs and AHTs on equine parasites that Martin created that's quite good. It is on the NOMS equine site. I'd encourage you to look at it because there's a lot of background in there and the current recommendations on uh, parasite control in equine is, is part of that module. And uh, Abby's working on you being able to get some credit for viewing the, the training modules. We did have a writing question um, whether the participants needed to complete the questionnaire to be eligible for the biologics, and the answer is yes. They do have to do the questionnaire to be eligible for any of the biologics or the biosecurity assessment. When we sent out the list of operations that have already participated in parasites, um, as Martin said, some of them have not yet submitted samples, but they do have kits. So your coordinator will tell you that that's an operation. You don't have to do the parasite section of the questionnaire, but remind them about the kits and remind them about, you know, getting those samples uh, submitted. So Daniel, I think we'd like to go to uh, Q&A um, and remind people on the call how they can do that. Okay, no problem. And ladies and gentlemen, as we move to Q&A, please feel free to place yourself into the question queue by pressing pound two on your telephone keypad. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please then state your name and your question. Once again, that is pound two to ask a question over the phone line. Any questions on the parasite section? We have Tom Google with us. Tom Brignoli raised his hand, so we're waiting for the typed-in question, I guess. Well, hi, can you hear me? We can, oh. Tom, go ahead. Okay, and, and I guess when I unmute, when, when I press the start two, my hand goes up. I, I didn't realize there was that neural connection there. 
Uh, no, I, I just have a question. You, if I understood, if I understood you right, you you re, you will offer a retest for those farms that did not um, get efficacious results with their deworming. Is that did I understand that right? Well, uh, thank oh. you. Thank you for asking the question, uh, and that gives me a chance to clarify because you know, so to. It's only for ivermectin uh, we offer this this service, and the reason why we do that is that we expect with strong jaw, we expect to see pine cell resistance on a lot of farms. We expect to see fenbenazole and oxybenazole resistance on a lot of farms. Ivermectin resistance has, in, as defined by a reduced efficacy two weeks post treatment, has still not been documented. Uh, so that would be a very unusual finding. However, we, you know, we, meaning myself and other parasitologists, have said this for years that it's just a matter of time before it happens. So when we do get one operation that has indications of lost efficacy, we would like to repeat uh, loss of efficacy for ivermectin. We would like to repeat that test to see if we can reproduce that finding. So yeah, uh, only for ivermectin, we're really not interested in repeating. Uh, parental efficacy or benzimidazole efficacy findings. Okay. And Tom, uh, FYI, we'll, we'll get to it when we get to the reports, but Martin codes the interpretation of the test results, and one of the codes is that there was ineffective um, treatment from the ivermectin, and it could be due to resistance of the parasites, it could be due to the product used, maybe it froze or wasn't handled properly or the horse didn't consume all of the product administered or it wasn't dosed correctly. So it could be any of those four things. Uh -huh. And then in the, in the script, in the report, it says um, they can contact Dr. Nielsen. It's got his contact info. They then are self-disclosing who they are because to this point Martin doesn't know the farm. He just knows a NOMS ID number. So they have to be willing to self-disclose. And then he talks to them and offers them this option of, of further testing if we see ineffective ivermectin treatment. Does that answer your question? Oh, oh yes, it, it does indeed. And it also leads to the point I was getting at, because if you repeat the, the test again and the owner misadministers it for whatever reason, like you mentioned, the second time the same way they did the first time, uh, you know, I'm not sure what value that is. It, it's valuable, but I'm not sure you can then make the leap to say that that you're seeing resistance. But no, uh, no, that that's that's absolutely correct. I mean, the we 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 cannot conclude uh, the big R word uh, at all. Really, if you if you really look at it, you know, very strictly, we can say that you know there's lots of efficacy for. And, then, and for the possible reasons that Josie just outlined, the thing is, you know, if you reproduce the finding, it increases the chance of it being a sign of resistance. But you're right, you know, we cannot be absolutely sure unless we do a study where, you know, the investigator or somebody, you know, a veterinarian goes out and administers the dewormer and makes sure that the dosing is correct. And even there, you know, there's still sources of variability. And so, yeah, you're absolutely correct, but it does have value to repeat a test regardless of what the nature of that test is and the possible sources of variation are. It certainly does have value that if you get the same finding twice, you know, it does provide some strength to that conclusion that there was a decreased efficacy observed on this operation. For, Still, we haven't concluded resistance, but certainly there's signs of reduced efficacy. And, and you know, Martin will be in touch with them, Tom, so, you know, he may suggest using a different um, ivermectin-containing product or a different batch or that kind of thing. Um, right. The other is there are some tests that can be done by labs like Martin where they actually can do more tests within the lab to look at susceptibility of these parasites. So 
we didn't want to pass up the opportunity because FDA is very interested to know if there is ivermectin, ivermectin resistant in equine parasites for following up on these farms where we did have that result. Cassidy Risk has a question. Cassidy Risk? Can you unmute your phone and ask your question? Caller, your line is unmuted. Please go ahead. Okay. Yes, my question um, is you, you mentioned, so I am recently uh, have been put in charge of the Maryland as an OMS coordinator. The previous coordinator is yes. moving. Um, and I did not receive anything in the mail about or an uh, email stating whether or not the farms that I have um, had done any previous parasite testing. Does that mean that, that all I can assume all of them did not? I sent an email to you and to the previous NOMS coordinator yesterday with that info, mm -hmm. but we can double check. Um, I didn't get it bounced back, but um, can Abby follow up with you on that um, after the call? Sure, sure, and I'll double but check my, my email as well. I'm having issues with my computer right now. It's not letting me log in, so it could be that I it came after I started having trouble with that. But I don't see it on my phone okay. email either. So I'll follow up. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Martin said he would stay on for a while. So if you think of some more, and, and I said this on the last webinar, but this isn't the end of our partnership. So if you think of something um, after the webinar you want to ask, uh, send those on to um, Abby. She deals with the ones that she can, and then she tracks people down to get answers to the rest. So don't hesitate. And if you have a question, probably somebody else has the same question. So um, don't hesitate to ask. All right, we're going to um, switch gears. And like the last webinar, we have um, people that can be on part, and, and then they need to do some other things. So we're going to um, skip. Um, to page 8 of tab 5 and do the kick uh, section next.